the title of the sermon today is Father, Forgive Them. And before we open God's Word to consider these words from our Lord Jesus Christ, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. O oh, glorious Father, I come to Thee, O oh Lord, at this time, a solemn and a serious time, to ask, O oh Father, for Thine anointing, to ask that this vessel will be cleansed and made pure before Thee, to plead, dear God, that the words that I speak will not be my words, but they will be Thy words, anointed with Thy Holy Spirit, to ask, O oh Father, that hearts will be prepared and be receptive to thy words so that thy words can be understood, they can be grasped, they can be loved, and they can be lived. Oh, Father, we pray in a special way today as we are beginning a new week of our family life prayer requests, and we're looking at our children's ministries department today, and we bring our little children before thee. Oh, Father, innocent little children, we thank Thee for them. We thank Thee for their energy. We thank Thee for their way of being. We thank Thee that they make us laugh, and they give us joy, and they give us strength, and they give us inspiration. And we pray for our dear little children today, that Thou wilt help them to grow up and be men and women of God, that Thou wilt protect them, O Father, in their lives, and give them Thy grace to love Jesus from this day forward and forevermore. And that Thou wilt be with their dear families and their parents as they face the difficulties of parenting in the 21st century. That Thou wilt give them the wisdom that they need to raise up their children, to train up a child in the way he should go, so that when he is old he will not depart from it. As our children grow, Lord, into adults, help them to be children in malice and in evil, but help them to be men and women in godliness, as Thy Word has prescribed. And Father, we pray for the children's ministries leaders, and those that minister to our children in this church, bless them and their families. Continue to give them wisdom and guidance and passion and zeal as they work with our children. We pray for those who are sick today, those that are anxious, those that are depressed, those that are disappointed. And we pray that they will find in Jesus their rock of hope and of salvation. And oh, Father, now may thy word go forth and may it prick hearts and may it give edification and comfort and strength so that thy name may be glorified. For we ask all these things in the blessed and holy name, which is above every name, the sweet name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. In this world of ours, there are many voices calling out to us. We are hit every day with different messages, opinions, Emotions, critiques, blogs, tweets, commentaries. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has something to say. Everybody has a voice. But many times the voices of this world cry out in confused tones, which rather than leading people to clarity, mislead them and deceive them. And unfortunately there are many voices like that as well. Voices that lead people into committing sin, into lying, into deceit, into the very things that kill human beings. I posit to you today that we need to hear one voice. The voice of one who speaks words of instruction and life into our very beings. Not my voice. The voice I'm talking about is the voice of Jesus. Today we want to hear in His voice words which will transform us. If we hear them, if we believe them, if we receive them, and if we obey them. I want to look at Jesus Christ's words on the cross today in Luke 23, 34, where he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm going to look at the one who speaks these words and the occasion in which they are spoken. We're going to look at the one to whom these words are spoken. We're going to look at the ones about whom these words are spoken. And we're going to look at the meaning of these words for us today. Firstly, the one who speaks these words and the occasion in which they are spoken. Turn to Luke chapter 23 in your Bibles. And the scripture reading verses 33 and 34. Luke chapter 23, 
verses 33 and 34. The Bible says in Luke 23, 33 and 34, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. These words were spoken by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus came to this world from heaven to show us who God is and what his character is like. Jesus said to his disciples, if ye have seen me, ye have seen the Father, meaning God. Jesus is the Son of God and was equal with God, but he came to this earth as a man. He came to be Emmanuel or God with us. He came to teach us and to show us where we went wrong in sin and how to make it right. He came to die for our sins on the cross and to be resurrected on the third day. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8 says it this way, For I delivered you unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of above five hundred, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. According to the Bible, Jesus was nailed to the cross for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. But not only according to the scriptures, which are the word of God, but also according to eyewitnesses. He was seen of Cephas, who is Peter, who we were talking about in the children's story. Then he was seen of the 12 apostles. Then he was seen of above 500 people, some of whom had died by the time Paul wrote this epistle, but many of them were still alive, and none of them ever refuted the evidence of their eyes that they saw the risen Savior. And last of all, he was seen of Paul. Paul, who was once an enemy of Christianity. Paul, who wanted to destroy the Christian church, had a vision of Christ. He saw him on the road to Damascus, and his life was never the same again. So there are many evidences that prove to us that Jesus rose from the dead. Evidence from the Scripture, the Bible, which is the Word of God, and also evidence from many eyewitnesses. Therefore, we can depend upon what we read in the Bible. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And where did he say these words? He didn't say these words in a comfortable setting, but in the most excruciating and terrible of situations. Here was the Savior of the world hanging on a cross, the most barbaric of killing instruments, where they would drive nails through your wrists, through your feet, and they would, they would bind you to this stake of wood until you bled to death. Why was he treated this way? What crime had he done? The Bible tells us that even his enemies said of him, he saved others. He saved others. Even his enemies, while we were, he was on the cross, said this of him. Notice verse 35. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. He saved others. And the only reason that he didn't come down from that cross, he could have come down from that cross, but the only reason he didn't come down from that cross is because what he did on that cross was to save the world. Even the thieves that were crucified with him, one of them in verse 39 said, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But notice what the other one said, verse 40. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. This man has done nothing wrong. And yet he's hanging on the cross. The Bible says of Jesus, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. So why was he crucified? He was crucified for telling the truth about himself, that he was the Son of God. He was crucified for telling the truth about his mission. 
He came to save the world. He was crucified for telling the truth about the world's condition. The world was in sin and is in sin. And the world desperately needs a savior. For the wages of sin is death. He was crucified for wanting to save the world and to do good. He was crucified by a world who was not worthy of him. He was crucified by a hostile and sinful and envious world. He was crucified by a world that was not worthy of his love, yet he submitted to be crucified by this type of world. And I want to ask you today, are we living in the same type of world today? If Jesus were to come to this world today, would he be crucified again? Absolutely. <coughs> because today, <clears throat> we are also living in a sinful world. Today, we are also living in an envious world. Today, we are also living in a confused world, in a murderous world, in a world where crime and deception and manipulation and lying and violence is rampant. Do we not? Take a good look around you and you'll see. You don't need surveys. You don't need statistics to see that this world is in a mess. And so this world today, more than ever, needs a savior. This world today, more than ever, needs to hear these words that were spoken by Jesus on the cross and to respond to these words. This world, more than ever, needs to know more about Jesus. Secondly, the one to whom these words were spoken, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They were spoken to God, His Father, the Father, the one of whom it is said, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That Father who sent His Son into the world, not so that His Son could be honored, not so that His Son could be lifted up, not so that His Son could be uh, treated like a king, but so that His Son could be murdered and tortured and insulted and mocked for the sins of the world. God created this world to be clean, to be peaceful, to be joyful and to be holy. But Satan the devil brought sin into this world and man imbibed it into his very being. And sin brought forth death and violence and every corruption that you see around you comes from sin. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says, but then Jesus came in the fullness of time sent by his Father to save the world. God was the one whom Jesus loved, served, and confided in in this world. Jesus loved praying to his Father. He loved listening to his Father. He loved obeying his Father. Jesus' greatest love was to be with his Father. His greatest fear was to lose touch with his Father. And because Jesus had such a strong connection to his Father, he was able to go through storms of life. He was able to go through insults. He was able to go through mockery. He was able to go through violence. He was able to go through anything because he had a strong connection with his Father. And that's the same connection that God wants to have with you and with me. So that no matter what difficulties we're going through, no matter what trials we're going through, we will be men and women of God. We will go through them courageously. We will go through them bravely. We will go through them peacefully. And we will come out triumphant on the other side. And what did the father say about the son? He said he was pleased with him. He did everything that pleased him. His father wanted everyone to hear his son and believe in his son so that they could be saved from this world of sin. What a relationship. What a father. This father was grieving for his son on the cross because his son was as an innocent lamb being slaughtered for evil, filthy, undeserving sinners like us. And his son was praying his forgiveness all this time for his killers. His loving and holy Father is waiting today for you and I to acknowledge and appreciate what His Son did on the cross for our sins. This loving Father is waiting for us to realize what He has given up for you and I to be able to live holy lives. What will our response be? What will our response be today? The only response, the only right response is to live a life that is pleasing to God. Amen? A life that God where God is pleased with us and where we have His peace. Now thirdly, we want to look at the ones about whom these words were spoken. Who, were these, who was this prayer for? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Well, you notice who was around the cross. People, in verse 35, stood beholding. Rulers derided him, saying he saved others. Soldiers, thieves, malefactors, criminals. The Jews and the Romans, in essence, represented the whole world. The Romans came from various places in the world, and the Jews were the people of God. The Jews represented God's people, religious people. Now here's a question. Why would religious people need to be forgiven? Why would he say of them also, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? You know why? Because these religious people at that time, these Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious rulers, were following their religion the wrong way. They were seeking to follow God on their own terms. And there are many people like that today. Many people today want to follow God according to their own terms. Many people want to have a God of their own making. Many people want to create a God of their own imagination. And they want to picture what they think God is like. But they don't want to allow God to be God in their lives. Many people today are following the rules of their own making. The morality of their own invention, of their own imagination rather than following the rules and the commandments of Almighty God. When we follow the commandments of Almighty God, we will have peace. Because the Bible says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. But those who run after God's commandments, they have His peace. God has given us the prescription for holy living today, and we ought to follow it. It is found in the book of books, the Holy Bible. And if we will open this book, and if we will read its sacred pages, and if we will obey what God says through the power of Christ in us, we will be able to have peace and victory in our lives. Amen? But these men followed God on their own terms and on their own desires, and so they ended up becoming prideful, self-righteous, hypocritical, sinful, and hateful. Everything that you hate about religious people, these people were. Everything that people say today about religious people, that they're a bunch of hypocrites, these people were hypocrites. That they're a bunch of self-centered people, prideful, they think they're holier than thou. These people were that kind of people. Why? Because they were following a God of their own devising. Those who follow Jesus Christ and those who follow His ways and His words, those people are people who have His humility and they have His love and they have His righteousness and they have His holiness and they have His character. Yes, there are not many of them out there, but there are many. There are some out there who want to follow God. And so these people, when, when we follow our own ways, this is how we become. Then you had the Pharisees and the scribes, the, 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 the leaders of these religious people. They represent formal religion without power. They represent people who do religious things, thinking that these religious things will cleanse you from your sins. And so you have people going on pilgrimages and, and, and walking on their knees for, for 100 miles so that they could have some form of satisfaction. And they don't realize that it's not the blood of the, on your knee that saves you. It's the blood of Christ that saves you. They don't realize that you can do things religiously. You can do things on a daily basis. You can go to church. You can seem religious. And yet you can be lost. They didn't realize that you can even carry around a Bible and profess to believe in it. But if you don't live the words and you don't allow those words to live in your heart, then you're not saved, but you're lost. So many of these men were able to quote the Bible, but they were not living the Bible. Many of them were able to quote what the Scripture said. They even memorized it, but it wasn't in their heart. It hadn't changed their lives. And they were seeking to bargain with God on their own terms instead of going to Him on His terms. Many live like this today as well. Oh Lord, if you help me in this area, I'll go to church. No, it's the other way around. You come to church and then God will help you in these areas. Oh Lord, if you help me pay these bills. Oh Lord, if you make me heal me. Oh Lord, if you do this for me, then I'll dedicate my life to you. Oh no, it's the other way around. First you seek the kingdom of heaven and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto thee. First you dedicate yourself to God and once you've dedicated yourself to God, He will dedicate Himself to changing you and making you a new creation. It is this way that it happens, not the other way around. 
Go bargain with God today. Go to Him on His terms and you will see the difference that He will make in your life. Then you had the wealthy and political people around the cross. And these people represent people who were there to show their power and their authority. After all, these were the very people who had used their connections with the Roman government to give Jesus over to them for crucifixion. They had judged Jesus, the Savior of the world, guilty. He who was the spotless Lamb of Almighty God. He who was holy, harmless, and undefiled. They thought they could judge Him with sin. And Jesus even questioned them. He said, which of you convinceth me of sin? And yet they were not able to answer Him. Because there, were no, there was no sin in Him. It's the same way today. There are a lot of people today who want to judge Jesus Christ. They want to think what they think Jesus is. Oh, He was a good man. Oh, He was a wonderful teacher. Oh, He was a good moral example. No, He was and is the Son of Almighty God. He was God in the flesh. And He said that about Himself. And He lived that way. And if you're going to believe in Jesus, you have to believe in Him in everything that He says about Himself. Many people today are judging Christ, but they have not gone to Him to have a living experience with Him. You cannot judge someone unless you've had time with them. Isn't that right? So often we hear about people and we, somebody tells us about somebody else and we immediately make a judgment call about that person. But we never go to that person to, to try to find out what makes them tick. What kind of person are they? Are these accusations true that I'm hearing about them? And when we've done that, if we see that the accusations are true, then we can rightly say they are true. But too many people are treating Jesus like, like that today. They've heard about Jesus through somebody else, or they've seen a bad example of Christianity, and immediately they judge the Savior by that example. Instead of coming to Jesus for themselves and finding out how beautiful, how pure, and how lovely He is. I can tell you without a doubt in my mind, I have known Him now for over 25 years, and He has never done anything wrong to me. He has always been good to me. I can see Him now, and I know Him now better than I've ever known Him, and I'm still getting to know Him even better. But I can tell you now, everything I heard before about Him was just rumor. Now I'm living by revelation. And so I urge you today, don't live by rumor when it comes to Jesus Christ. Live by revelation. Come to Him directly. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good for yourself. Get to know Him, and you will never regret it. People think today that politics is the answer to solving the world's problems. Or education is the answer to solving the world's problems. Or more money can solve the world's problems. But I'll tell you something. All the good politics in the world cannot forgive sin. All the good politics in the world, all the good education in the world cannot forgive sin. All the money in the world cannot cleanse you from sin. God cannot be paid with money. He can only be paid with a contrite heart. That is what God requires of us. And it is only the blood of Jesus Christ that can forgive our sins. You notice society? It's become more technologically advanced, so-called. It's become more sophisticated. But yet, murder and crime and deception and corruption are still rampant. Science is trying to look for new ways to cure diseases in the world and to solve the world's problems. And in some cases it has made advances, but the diseases now are advancing beyond science. So the sin problem has not been cured. And the only way the sin problem can be cured, my friends, is through Jesus Christ. And then you had the poor and the working folk that came to see Jesus on the cross. Some came out of hate to mock him because they had heard bad things about him and they made their judgment call before they knew him. Some came to sadly see their hopes crushed, or so they thought. Many of these people wanted to bring their sick to Jesus because they had heard that he cured them miraculously. But here now they saw him on the cross and they lost hope and they said, how will we have this cure? How will we have this healing? He's on the cross. They thought that him being on the cross was going to crush their hopes, but Him being on the cross actually made new hope. Gave a lively hope. Gave a greater hope. Many today have lost faith in God 
because of their circumstances. Many today have said, I lost my faith in God because I had a trial. I had a betrayal. I had a hardship. My dear friend, you must not live by circumstances. You must live by principles. Circumstances will always change. Things will always go from bad to worse and from worse to better. We cannot live on what we see around us. We must live by faith, not by sight. We must live by the principles of God. And all right principles come from the Word of God and from His law. Today, when you learn to live on principle, principle will never fail you. Because principle is always consistent. Principle will always be consistent even in the darkest of times. You can be in the darkest of times. You can be in the cruelest of times. You can be in the worst of times. And yet God can give you His peace which surpasses understanding. That principle will never fail you if you come to God and you cling to Him. Don't live by circumstances today. Don't allow circumstances and trials in your life to make you lose hope in God. For it is only God that is our hope. Only God can give us strength through trials and through bad circumstances. No one else can. People will fail you. The world will fail you. Circumstances will fail you. Your dreams will fail you. But God will never fail you. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He cannot fail and He will not fail. And then we had His disciples. The disciples represent the churchgoers. And how were the disciples here? They were confused, they were saddened, they were shocked. They thought that Jesus was going to rebuild the empire, take over the Roman Empire, and put them to be kings with him in that empire. They had forgotten his words to them that before the crown has to come the cross. They had forgotten the fact that he had told them several times, he had warned them, the Son of Man will be crucified, but he will rise on the third day. They'd forgotten that. And, and they didn't understand it even when he told it to them. But they didn't even ask him about it. They wanted to live according to the things that they believed about him rather than the truths that he was saying about himself. And today, Church of God, we need to, uh, we need to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The disciples did not live by the word, every word that Jesus had spoken, but they lived by their own opinions and interpretations or ignorance of those words. And therefore, when the crisis came, they were at a loss to explain it. They were at a loss to go through the trial. It's the same with his disciples today. If we do not heed the words of Christ in the Bible, we will also become confused, disappointed, and shocked when prophecy fulfills all around us. Didn't our Savior say, if they hated me, they're going to hate you? Didn't our Savior say, if they keep my word, meaning they're watching every word I'm speaking so that they can trip me up, they're going to keep your words? Didn't our Savior say, a servant is not greater than his master, but it is good enough that a servant be as his master? So just as Jesus was treated, we're going to be treated. We need to remember that. So that when we face the trials, we're not going to stand there shocked and confused, but we're going to say, this is what Jesus said was going to happen. Now, Lord, give me the strength to honor thee through this trial. Give me the strength to persevere, O oh Lord. Give me the strength to, to pull through. And every time I have done that in my life, and every time you've done that in your life, you have seen how God has helped you through. Amen? You can be a witness to that today. And then there were his general followers, general people. Some people followed him for his healing, others for his feeding. They wanted food, and he could multiply food from what they heard. So now they were perplexed. And there are some... People today who style themselves Christians and religious who only come to the church to see what they can get from Christ rather than to see what they can give to Christ. Christ has a lot to give us. He has a lot of blessings and benefits. But we are not there simply to follow Him for His benefits. We are there to follow Him so that we can be like Him and we can glorify Him on this earth. We are not here to get from God. We are here to give to God because God has already given us enough. He's given us His Son. And that is more than anything else anyone can give us. And then there were the curious bystanders around the cross. Some were just curious, without an opinion, for or against Christ. And many of these same curious people would later become his disciples after they saw how he died and how he was resurrected and how his resurrection transformed his disciples from fearful men to faithful men. 
How is it that a group of 11 men could go from being fearful to being so courageous that they would die for the name of Jesus? Because they had seen him. He was risen. They knew he was alive. And he gave them the power to go through. And a lot of these curious people, when they saw these men later, they knew that Jesus was truly alive. Why? Because Jesus was truly alive in them. And that is our greatest evidence today that we have. How do I know Jesus is alive? Because he's alive in me. Because the things that I used to do, I don't do anymore. The things that I used to like that were sinful, I don't like them anymore. And the things that I used to hate, I love now that, were, that are good and that are holy and that are pure. I see a change in my whole being. That change cannot come about by psychology or psychotherapy. That change can only come about through Jesus Christ. Today, many of you may be curious. You may have come here out of curiosity as well. I urge you today to look and to consider what Jesus is saying in the lives of his true followers today. I'm here to tell you today that Jesus still sets the drug addict free. I was one of them. I was set free by God's grace. Today, he still heals those that are sick. Today, he still transforms people who were criminals who are now good citizens. Today, he still transforms lives. He still changes hearts. He still changes characters. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Glory, hallelujah, to his name. And today, he can do the same for you. He can set you free from sin and unrighteousness. And he can make you a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then you had the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers represent the sinful world at large, the stubborn sinful world at large. The soldiers were casting dice for Jesus' robe while he was hanging on the cross. They had just nailed him to the cross and now they were casting dice for his robe. And while they were doing that, he said, Father, forgive them. And these Roman soldiers represent people who are seeking the pleasures of this life in the midst of the reality of sin and of death. They represent people who want to have a good time and they want to have it now in the midst of death. You wonder to yourself, how could these men have been so calloused and so steel-hearted that they could sit there and roll the dice to get a robe of the man they had just crucified on the cross? But yet they were. They had become callous through years of violence. They had become callous through years of battle. They had become callous through years of insensitivity. And there are many people today in the world who have become callous by the things of the world. They have become uh, rock-hearted and steely conscienced because they are living for the pleasures of the world and for the pleasures of the world alone. And even though they see that this life is temporary, even though they see that we only have a limited time on this earth, even though they see that we are here today and gone tomorrow, that life is so fickle and so sensitive and so weak and so temporary, yet they still take the risk of shooting dice in the worldly things. I mean, you see life. I don't have to tell you about the reality of life. People die every day, don't they? And it's not only older people that die, it's young people that die. It's children that die. People die. And our society today has tried to put that under the rug and say, oh, death, we don't think about it. Or if somebody dies, they say, oh, yeah, he's, he's figure skating in the sky now. As if everybody who dies goes to one place and one place only. There is no heaven and there is no alternative for them. It's all one place. And we try to ignore death, but death is a very stern reality. And we need to realize that we only have a limited time on this earth. We only have but a few days. And these days on this earth is a probationary period. It is a school to prepare us for the next life. The question is, what are we doing with the time that we have? Are we clinging to Jesus and accepting His forgiveness? Or are we rolling the dice and playing Russian roulette with our lives? What are we doing? The Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead even while she liveth. Jesus tells the parable of a rich fool who had so many grains and he had so much crop and he had so many riches. 
And one day he sat down and he said to himself, I have so much. You know what I'm going to do with it? He didn't say I'm going to give it away to anybody. He didn't say I'm going to feed the poor in my community. What did he say? He said, I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to build bigger barns to store all this grain in that I've been given. <coughs> and then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to say, soul, take your time, live happy, eat, drink, and be merry. How many people today are living that same kind of philosophy? They're saying, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Let's just have a good time because everything is, is, is going to end anyway, so what's the use? And that night, the Bible says, God appeared to him in a dream and he said, You fool! This night, your life is required of you. This night, your life is required of you. And what are you going to do with all those things that you've been saving? Are you going to get to enjoy them? No, sir. You're not going to enjoy them at all. All those things that you've saved are useless now to you because your life is forfeit. So what's the use of enjoying the pleasures of this world if one day these pleasures are going to end? I would rather have the option, and praise God we have the option, of enjoying eternal things for eternity in heaven with Jesus. But Jesus says that a man's life does not consist in the things that he possesses. A man's life is not about what he has. It's about who has him. It's about what character he has. It's about what kind of person he is. Because character, character cannot be bought or sold when it's good character. Character cannot be bribed when it's good character. Character cannot be threatened when it's good character. Character cannot be frightened when it's good character. Character will go forward and be victorious when it is Christ-like character. And Jesus asks the question after saying these things in the Gospels. He says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will it profit you even if you had all the world's money <coughs> if one day you're going to die anyway? What will it profit you if you had all the fame in the world if one day you're going to die anyway? What would it profit you if you had all the luxuries, if you had all the lusts, if you, had all, if you could fulfill every lust and every whim if one day you're going to die anyway? But choose the better way. The better way is having eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The better way is being able to enjoy heaven because Jesus made this possible. Today, don't live in sin and remember that we have but a short time to make things right in this world. But fourthly and finally, we want to look at the meaning of these words for ourselves today. First of all, these words were prophetic. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They were prophetic. It was prophesied that he would pray for these men. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 12. Written over 700 years, 500 years at least before this took place in Luke. <coughs> this prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 53 talks about Jesus and what he would go through and how he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, how he was crucified. But it says in verse 12, in the end of verse 12, at the very last part of the verse, it says what? And made intercession for the transgressors. He prayed for the sinners. And he would do that on the cross. Because that chapter prophesies about the cross. God had already planned these things with his son. So that when he comes to this earth, he would be able to speak those words so that his father could have mercy on those terrible people who didn't even know what they were doing. Now it's one thing to agree to do something beforehand, and it's another thing to actually do it when the time comes. The father and the son agreed to this, and when Jesus was on that cross, praise God, he didn't shrink, but he went through and made intercession for the transgressors. Praise God that he went through and he prayed, not only for them, but also for us. As one man said, he was slain by them, yet he begged for them. He begged his father to forgive those very people who were murdering him. A human being cannot do that. A human being does not have it in himself or herself to forgive someone who's killing them. Because a human being wants to survive. And a human being who's being threatened with violence or with any type of terror or death 
will retaliate and will want to retaliate. But not a human being that is filled with Jesus Christ. Uh, that kind of human being becomes a different being altogether. And it mystifies the world when they see this type of forgiveness because they can't explain it. You can't explain this kind of forgiveness. It takes guts to be able to forgive like this. A wimp can't do it. A weakling will only uh, uh, follow his nature. What did he say? Father, forgive them. That word forgive means pardon, remit, cancel, allow, permit, tolerate, let alone yield it up. The modern word for forgive, the modern Greek word for forgive literally means to make room to breathe. Why? Because sin has a stranglehold on this world. And when Jesus, when we come to Jesus and we ask Him to forgive us, He gives us room to breathe, to see how terrible our sin is, to see what our sin has done to us, and to imbibe His righteousness. Forgive them, pardon them, remit this sin, cancel out this sin, allow these people to go free, tolerate this, what's being done right now, leave it alone, Father. Because the Father had the right at that moment as they were crucifying His Son to blot out the whole world out of existence. But yet, that intercessory prayer of Jesus saved us all. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. When we sin, we break God's law. And when we sin, we invite death into our lives. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. And how many have sinned? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what do we do? The Bible says we need to repent. We need to repent. We need to turn around from the way that we're walking, from the way that we're going, and we need to turn around and follow the right way and the good way because we're going backwards according to the Bible. Look at this world. This world is not going forwards. This world is going backwards, is it not? You don't see this world getting better and better. You see this world getting worse and worse. Repent, God says. Turn around. Repent and be baptized, Christ Peter, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent and be baptized. Come to Jesus and make right with your sins and He will wash you of your sins and make you clean. Don't you want to be clean today? We love cleanliness when it comes to the body. We love to bathe ourselves to be clean. But how much more must we love the cleanliness of the heart? People today are, are dying. They're taking drugs. They're taking uh, pills to put them to sleep. They're taking antidepressants. They're taking all kinds of drugs and pills to stifle their consciences, and they notice that their conscience is still there. The guilt is still there. It's still eating away at them. It doesn't go away with medicine. The only medicine that can make the guilt go away is the precious blood of Jesus. When we come and when we ask Him to forgive us of our sins, the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. What we have to do is come before God and confess and say, Lord, I am a sinner. I have done wrong. I have committed crimes against heaven. I want to be made right with Jesus. And then we have to forsake our sins. It's not just a matter of forgiving of our sins. The false religions of the world, you'll notice, they do the same thing. If you want forgiveness, you go, you make a sacrifice, or you talk to somebody, you have a confession, do something, and then that sin is forgiven, and then you can go do it again, and then have it forgiven again, and then go do it again, and have it forgiven again, and you have this cycle. Let me ask you, is that person pure? No, just temporarily. Then he goes and sins again. But the Bible, the Bible gives us the solution to this. We can not only be forgiven, we can not only be cleansed, but we can also have the power to forsake our sins. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, He that covers his sins will not prosper. If you try to hide your sins or you try to say, I'm not a sinner. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I haven't done anything wrong. You're not going to prosper. You're not going to go forward in the spiritual life. You're going to be miserable because you're lying to yourself and you're lying to God. But here's the beautiful part of this verse. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Oh, we need the mercy of God today. We need the forgiveness of Christ today. 
we need to be cleansed today because that cleansing is not just a temporary cleansing. That cleansing gives us the power to forsake our sins also. God, Father, forgive them, them and us. See, they crucified Jesus physically, but we crucified him spiritually. It is because of my sins, even if it was the smallest sin, even if it was the tiniest sin, even if it was the most insignificant of sins according to the world, for my sin, Jesus came down here to die on that cross. Doesn't matter how small it was. It doesn't matter how insignificant it was according to the world. For one sin, he came and he died on the cross. Therefore, he died because of my sin. Therefore, I crucified him. And so did you. All of our sins crucified him. And yet, as he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Now, the Romans knew that they were crucifying an innocent man, more or less. But they didn't know who that man was. It was after Jesus died that one of the centurions said, Behold, this was a righteous man. Behold, this man was the Son of God. Then he realized it. When he saw how he died, when he saw what he did on that cross, he forgave the thief on the cross. He, he, he took care of his mother on that cross. He prayed for the world on that cross. He didn't think of himself once on that cross. So when he died, that Roman centurion was able to say that was the Son of God. But before that, he had no idea. He thought it was just another man, some crazed fanatic who was going around teaching things. But this was not a crazed fanatic. This was the Son of the living God. The Jews could have known that this was the Messiah. They just needed to check the evidence and they just needed to look at him more closely. And some of them actually did know. But they didn't know the extent of what they were doing by allowing him to go on that cross. That's why he says they know not what they do. That word know means to see and to see in such a way that it becomes a reality. They, they knew in the basic sense, but not in the spiritual sense of reality. And so today when we sin against God, when we sin against God, when we commit sin and unrighteousness, when we neglect God, when we neglect Jesus Christ, when we neglect all the good things that God has for us, we have no idea what we're doing. We have no idea how bad sin actually is. Because the world tells us sin is okay, right? What does the world tell you? If it feels good, do it. Do whatever you feel like doing. If it helps you, if it makes you laugh, if it, gives you, if it gets you your kicks, go and do it. That's what the world tells us. We don't know what we're doing. We have no idea what we're doing to ourselves and to others and to God. No idea that we crucified Jesus on the cross and what that means. Do we realize what our sins have done to us and to God? If we truly realize it, we will come to Christ and seek His salvation. Here are some lessons for these words, from these words. First of all, we have a duty as Christians to pray for our enemies. If Jesus was able to hang on that cross and pray for his enemies, we also ought to pray for our enemies. When Stephen was being stoned in the act of receiving the stones in his head, crushing his skull, he was able to look up to heaven and say, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Why? Because he had Christ in him. Therefore, he was able to do the very same thing that Jesus did. The Christian today who has Christ in them can also pray for their enemies. And what is that prayer ultimately about? That prayer should not ultimately be to, 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 to slaughter them or to give them judgment. That prayer should be for their forgiveness. So that they can know the forgiving love of Jesus and they can draw to Him and be saved. The aim of our prayer should be forgiveness and salvation for those who don't know Christ. And then thirdly, these words show the power and the excellency of Christ and Christianity. There is no other religion that says love your enemies, pray for them. All the other religions that imbibed that philosophy did it after the fact. They were not like that before. There's only one that says forgive your enemies, love your enemies. Do good to those that use you, despitefully use you and abuse you. Pray for them. Because only Jesus could do it. He was the Son of God. 
And therefore, he gives us the power now and the excellency of true Christian character. And the fourth one is good news also. The greatest sinners through the intercession of Jesus may still obtain pardon. You can be the greatest sinner in the world. You can be a murderer. You can, you can have committed acts that are the most atrocious acts in the whole wide world. And if you come to Jesus and you confess those sins to Him and you say, I'm not doing this again. I'm forsaking these sins. I don't want this again in my life. He can forgive you. No one else can do that. Only Jesus can do that. Doesn't matter how far you've gone. There's still hope if you're convicted to come to Jesus. There's still hope if the Holy Spirit is reaching your heart today and He's calling out to you to come to Christ and be saved. God heard Him then on the cross and God still hears His Son today. And the fifth lesson we learn from these words is the necessity of responding to these words. My dear friends, the Romans and the Jews who did not respond were spared that day. But after that day, when they continued sinning, if they continued sinning, and, and many of them did, and they didn't come to Christ, they died lost men. So these words on the cross are not there to simply make us sit back and say, well, Jesus prayed for my forgiveness, so I don't have to do anything else now. I can just sit back and relax. No, 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 no. We must come to Christ and we must make it right with Him. We must come to Jesus and make it right with Him. Those men were spared that day. But if they didn't come to Jesus and make things right, they died lost. Today you can hear these words from this sermon, from this scripture. You can hear these words and you can say, Jesus prayed for forgiveness. But if you don't take part in that forgiveness, if you don't come to Christ and make things right, you will die a lost man, a lost woman. To die a lost man and a lost woman is the worst condition you can be in. You can have the worst disease this world can offer you. You can have the worst reputation this world can offer you. You can be living in the worst circumstances, but to die a lost man and a lost woman is the worst of these all. For that basically says that your life was for nothing. But my friends, that is not the way God sees things today. He's not the, it's not the way God sees you today. Your life has a purpose. You were created for something greater than this. You were put on this earth to do a work for God. You are not here for nothing. You're not here by coincidence. You didn't come in here just by chance. You came in here because there's a God of love that is after your soul. And He wants you today because He wants to save you. But you need to respond to His words. During the Korean War, a South Korean Christian, a civilian, was arrested by communists and ordered shot. But when the young communist leader learned that the prisoner was in charge of an orphanage caring for small children, he decided to spare him and kill his son instead. So you can imagine now them bringing his son out, 19-year-old boy, and shooting him right between the eyes in the presence of his father. After a few years, the fortunes of war changed. And the young communist leader was now captured by the United Nations forces. And in his trial, they tried him and they condemned him to death. But before the sentence could be carried out, a man got up from the back. And it was the man whose boy, that boy, had killed. And he got up in front of the court and he said, I may speak to the court and he said I'm pleading for the life of this killer he declared that he was young and that he really did not know what he was doing give him to me said the father of the murdered son and I'll train him and he took the killer of his son into his house and he began teaching him the ways of righteousness the United Nations forces granted the requests, and he took him, and he cared for him. Today, and this was a few years back, but today the former young communist is a Christian pastor. <laughs> what a transformation. From murderer to Christian pastor. Eh? What a transformation. That 
my friends, is the transforming and life-changing power of Christ's forgiveness. That's how it works. That's how it changes you. And it's been repeated over and over and over throughout time, and it's still being repeated to this day. To this day, there are people in this room who could stand up here and tell you, I was once a drug addict, now I'm free. I was once a criminal. I was once a vicious sinner. I was once a worldly man. I was once a man who loved lusts and loved the pleasures of this life. Now I love Jesus and I love Him more than anyone else. There are people in this room that could stand up and testify to that today. And I'm one of them. He can change your life today. He can transform your life today. But you must give Him your life. Jesus Christ changed my life. When I discovered Him, and when I got to know Him, I got to love Him. And the more I get to know Him, the more I love Him. And the more I get to see Him at work in my life, the more I'm in awe of Him. Because He's taken a drug addict, an alcoholic, a man with violence in his temper, a man with all these sins, and He's changed me and made me into a new creation in Christ Jesus. He still has work to do, and He's still working on me. But praise God, He has changed me from darkness to light. And He can change your life today too, whoever you are. He can change you. Will you not seek His forgiveness today? My appeal is for three things in the presence of God today. The first one is to repent of your sins. You must confess that you are a sinner, that you've broken God's commandments. You've been a thief, you've been a liar, You've been a murderer. You've been an idolater. You've been an adulterer. You've been a coveter. You've taken His name in vain. You've broken His Sabbath day. You have sinned against Him. You've hated others in your heart. If you had a chance, you could kill them. If you could get away with it. You have sinned in your heart. You've lusted after a woman in your heart and committed adultery with her in your heart. You have sinned against Him. You must confess your sin today. You must confess the fact that you are a sinner and you have broken His law. And secondly, you must confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Jesus died on that cross and He was able to say, for you, look down the corridors of time and see you in your guilt, in your sin, in our unrighteousness, and see our forgive them for they know not what they do. Is He not worthy to be your Savior and your Lord? Who else would do that for you? Who else would do it? And who else had the, would have the power to do it and to make sure that it got done? Only Jesus. And thirdly, to forsake our sins, to forsake this world, and to seek heaven today. What is God telling you in your heart today? Don't well, listen to me. I'm not trying to sell you anything. If God is convicting you of something today, you need to respond to it. If God is showing you a way today that you need to walk, you need to respond to it. God is calling you today and He's ready to change your whole life. Are you going to respond to that? I'm so glad I responded 25 years ago or so. I'm so glad I responded. It's made a world of difference in my life. Won't you respond today to Christ? And so today, if you want to say these things to Jesus, and you want to give Him this prayer in your heart, to repent of your sins, to confess Christ as Lord and Savior, to forsake your sins, this world, and to seek heaven, and to begin the process of preparing yourself to give your life fully to Him, I'm going to ask you to kneel with me wherever possible. If you can't kneel physically, that is fine. It's understandable. But if you are physically able to kneel, and you want to respond to this message to the Word of God, to the Holy Spirit that is calling you, please kneel today in the presence of God. And you're talking to God today. Oh, Father in heaven, oh, Lord, what can we say? What can we say in view of that love, that wondrous love of Christ? who was able to pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that them in that word is us. It's me. Oh, Father, you were sinners. You are sinners. 
we are captivated by sin. We are captivated by unrighteousness. And we see, Lord, that that kind of life has only led us to misery, to pain, to depression, to failure. Father, we want to break loose today. And we know that there's a Savior who is able to break us free. And so we come, first of all, confessing ourselves to be sinners in need of repentance. We come to Thee, O Lord, confessing that we are criminals at the bar of God, confessing that we have sinned and sinned and sinned, even knowingly. And we come to Thee, O Father, because we long that Thou wilt give us repentance, that we can turn from our wicked ways and come to Christ, who is life and joy and peace. And Father, today we want to make things right with Thee. And so, Father, as the sins are in our hearts today, we want to repent of them. Cleanse us, O Lord, of our criminality, of our ungodliness, of our unrighteousness, of our hatred, of our envy, of our strife, of our idolatry, of our adultery, of our perversion, of our all these things that so easily beset us, O Lord, our addictions. And help us to be free today through the blood of Jesus. We want to confess Jesus as Lord and Christ today as Savior. We want to confess Him, Lord, so that we can draw to Him and He can become our Savior and He can become our leader and our guide in our lives. We've been living life on our own terms or on the terms of others, but we have been led astray and we've fallen into the pit of self-doubt and depression and misery so many times. We long to follow Christ on the straight and narrow road today. So, Father, may Christ become our Savior and our Lord today. May we be able to confess not only with our lips, but with our hearts that He is the Savior of Saviors and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord, give us the strength today to forsake our sins. We bring them to Thee and we ask for Thy forgiveness. We plead, O Father, that we can have victory. And we know that the victory can only be found through Christ, for whom the Son sets free is he free indeed. And greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. And so, Father, we come to the living Christ so that we can have him in our hearts and in our lives so he can change us today. Help us, Lord. Some people may have knelt here for the first time because they long to have Jesus in their lives. Help them as they begin this journey, this road to getting to know him, to getting to love him, and to giving their lives over to him. We thank Thee and we praise Thee for all that Thou art about to do. And we ask all these things in that beautiful, merciful, and lovely name that is above every name, the sweet name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen.